Hello, I'm Vahani Rujian and I will be presenting the paper titled Scalability of Network Visualization from a Cognitive Load Perspective. I will talk through the first half of the presentation and my colleague Yalong Yang from Harvard University will present the second half. I would like to acknowledge our co-authors Tim Dwyer, Lee Lawrence, Michael Weibrow and Kim Marriott from Monash University. Showing a large number of data points as marks is a challenge in any visualization design. I can car categorize scalability challenges into six categories, monitor resolution, visual metaphors, interactive techniques, data structures, algorithms, and human perception. Yet human perception, and in particular the effects of cognitive load, is understudied in graph visualization. Node-link diagrams are used to visualize relational data. Nodes are used to represent objects, and links are used to represent relationships between these objects. Similar to other visualizations, beyond a specific threshold, node link diagrams become unreadable and resemble hairballs. There has been a lot of research exploring the effects of layout features for node link diagrams on readability and task effectiveness. Yorujian et al. present an exhaustive survey of such studies. Even though there have been several studies to evaluate the visual scalability of node link diagrams, they rarely significantly vary the size of the networks. Also, instead of looking at the general limitations of network visualizations, most studies are tailored to evaluate or show the limitations of a technique that is being tested. To our knowledge, physiological measures have been rarely used to evaluate data visualizations, such as the study by Anderson et al that measure cognitive load in participants when identifying the larger interquartile range on different types of box plots. Another example is the study conducted by Peck et al, which compares the task difficulty of estimating differences between two highlighted sections in bar charts versus pie charts. However, none has been used to evaluate network visualizations. Neuroscientists have identified different brain regions that are associated with various functions. Knowing which parts of the brain are involved in visualization tasks would help us understand and better evaluate cognitive load. To our knowledge, no previous study has investigated brain activity for a network visualization task. We wanted to explore the threshold of complexity, at which node link diagrams become useless without interaction or aggregation. However, we did not want to solely rely on performance measures and self-reported difficulties of the participants. We devised and conducted a user study which would help investigate human perception with respect to variations in size of node link diagrams. We generated scale-free networks of varying sizes, starting at 25 nodes up to 175 nodes in increments of 25 nodes. We used three densities, a factor of 2, 4, and 6, thus having 21 networks. We also generated two instances of each network, resulting in a total of 42 networks. The diagrams were created using the force directed layout of WebCola. All the drawings were displayed in the same size for all participants and trials. The participants were not allowed to zoom in or interact with the diagrams. We decided to limit the study to one task, so that we do not have to worry about the differences in the intrinsic difficulties of each task. In addition to being one of the most commonly used tasks in network visualization studies, finding the shortest path is also proven to be effectively performed on node link diagrams. We pick two nodes for each graph by selecting the node furthest away from the center of the diagram, and then highlighting the nearest node on the opposite side of the vector. We ask the participants to count the number of nodes on the shortest path between these two highlighted nodes. In this example, there are a total of six nodes on the shortest path. It is common to find multiple shortest paths between two nodes. In this example, there are six different paths. The study had 22 participants with backgrounds in computer science, all of whom reported that they were familiar with the task of finding the shortest path between two nodes in a node link diagram. In addition to performance measures, such as accuracy, response time, and self-reported difficulty, we measured heart rate variability, brain activity, and pupil dilation. The equipments we used were non-invasive. Thanks, Vohan, for presenting the first part. My name is Yalong Yang from Harvard University. I will take over here to present our data analysis and results. We will first look at some traditional measures, for example, accuracy. We use x-axis to represent the increasing number of nodes in a graph. We recorded three types of results from our participants, correct and wrong answers. We also allow participants to choose unsure if they struggle to give an answer. The y-axis shows the percentage. We use a stacked bar chart to show the distribution of each type of responses. This figure shows how the accuracy changes in a graph density of 2. Graph density is the number of links divided by the number of nodes. We also tested graphs in different densities. As what we would expect in all graph densities with increasing number of nodes, 
the accuracy generally went down. You may also notice that for large graphs, the accuracy was even close to zero, while for the smallest graph, our participants achieved a high accuracy. We do this on purpose to cover a wide range of graph sizes. In this way, we were able to capture a wide range of other measures we are going to talk about. Let us then look at another commonly used measure, self-reported difficulty. We ask our participants to rate in 9 points Likert scale for each trial, from very very easy to very very difficult. Here we use the same type of chart to show the distribution. Like the accuracy, the trend is predictable. There is an overall positive correlation between the number of nodes and the reported difficulty in all graph densities. We also recorded the time our participants spend on each trial. Here we use error bars to represent the 95% confidence interval. Comparing to the previous two measures, this one looks a bit surprising. In the first stage, with the increasing number of nodes, participants spend more time on the trials. However, at a certain level of difficulty, the time decreased. Our explanation of this is that when the complexity of the trial increased to a certain level, people started to give up after some initial attempts, so the overall time dropped. In the literature, self-reported difficulty was the most widely used measure for cognitive load. Here, we use a different perspective to look at this measure. We divided every participant's responses into two categories, easy and difficult, based on their self-reported difficulties. We then aggregate the EEG data for these trials. Here is the EEG topographic map for the easy and difficult category. The color stands for the strength of the EEG signal. We can see clear differences between some brain regions, like the marked ones. To see the differences more clearly, we create a topographic map showing the differences between difficult and easy. We highlighted the electrodes that had a clear differences on the right. Different brain areas have different functionalities. Here we present information we collected from the literature. We can see these regions are associated with functions like decision making, problem solving, motor planning, visual spatial processing and perception, lower level visual processing, and memory. These functions are required for completing our tasks. In the described analysis, we only have two categories, easy and difficult. To obtain a more nuanced understanding of the physiological measures, we need to extract a uniform measure for the trials. We call this hardness. We believe the hardness re is reflected by the traditional measures, that is accuracy, self-report difficulty, and time. One way is to extract a latent variable behind them. So we use the principal axis factoring to extract the hardness from the three traditional measures. Next, we are going to look at the relationship between hardness and the physiological measures. Let us first check the relationship between EEG and the hardness. We choose the electrodes that we identified in our preliminary analysis. The x-axis is showing hardness from easy to difficult, and the y-axis shows the normalized EEG power. It had a similar trend as time. For most electrodes, it went up and down. We conjecture that it is because once the task becomes very difficult, participants switched off and no longer make the effort to find the right answer, so cognitive load decreased. Following the literature, we also collected the pupil dilation as a proxy measure of cognitive load. The pupil dilation also shared a similar pattern with the EEG and time. Let us then look at the heart rate variability. It is also a commonly used measure for cognitive load in the literature. The trend was slightly different than the previous ones. It went up and down just like the EEG and pupil dilation, but it went significantly up at the hardest level. This is possibly because that heart rate is also influenced by frustration and anxiety. Participants' cognitive load decreased but frustration or anxiety was increased, resulting in the overall increase. We first look at how to extract the hardness from traditional measures. We also look at how the physiological measures affected by the hardness. But it is unclear what affect the hardness. 
In the experiment, we explicitly controlled the number of nodes and the density. Because these are the two measures widely used in the literature in graph visualization user studies. However, we would like to investigate other graph and layout features in the dataset we generated. We divide these features into three groups. First one describes the size of the graph. It contains number of nodes, number of links, and density. Second describes the crossings from various perspectives. Please see our paper for details. The last type contains features related to the shortest paths. We use the linear model to find the relationships between these features and the hardness. Here, we demonstrate the top 12 models with just one predictor. We can see the top two predictors are the features for graph size, and the later 10 predictors are features for crossings. We also run linear model with two predictors. We found adding one predictor can improve the model's accuracy significantly. The top model was combination of size plus crossing and shortest path plus crossing. We also run models with three predictors. However, there is no significant improvement on model accuracy. In summary, we identified the upper bound of complex graph people can read. We found three regions that possibly associated with finding the shortest path task. We also found cognitive load increased with task hardness until our threshold, after which it decreases as the user may give up and put less efforts in. We built models between hardness and graph features. We found global features had a greater impact on hardness. Thank you very much for your attention.